Hello, my name is Nick. I'm an American from New Jersey, and this is my wife, Meruert. She's Kazakh, and we live in Kazakhstan. As you can see, we have a real international family. But this doesn't prevent us from being happy at all. In the last episode, I shared with you the important events that happened in our lives. My wife and I had a second child. Now all of my attention is directed towards the upbringing of my two children. My daughter, Aria, and our baby boy, John. Very often, people ask me what traditions we're going to use to bring up our children, or what language they're going to speak. Of course, it's important for me that my children can be fluent in at least two languages, Kazakh and English. Well, as for upbringing, here, of course, many factors play a role. The most important thing in our family, as well as in any other family, in my opinion, is this peace and harmony. Although I understand that there are so many other nuances that need to be taken into account, such as, first and foremost, the personalities and characters of the parents. Now, when it comes to bringing up children, this is a very, very interesting and uh, it's a value-laden part of life. Well, I'm from Nigeria. My family is international and uh, my wife is Kazakh. We, we give children values right from you know, day one. You bring up children in a way that uh, you know that uh, this is from the perspective of the parent, this is good for the children. Tolerance to other people, uh, value education, loving each other. From the very early age, they learn this, and uh, as they grow up, this stays with them all their life. Как Япония, Корея. Ну, я считаю это очень как строго. As well as the environment, and of course the foundations of society. Japan and Korea are very strict with this, especially when it comes to education. You shouldn't ask an older person, it's impolite. In such a situation, it's difficult for children to fully understand the question that why, for example, one plus one equals two? Why two? Here, everything is different. School children can ask questions to their parents and teachers, and they can talk to each other and communicate freely. This is a big difference, and I think it's a big plus for children. If we talk about Kazakhstan, I can say that there are so many interesting cultural peculiarities in raising children here, and the older generation traditionally plays a great role in this process. It was the grandparents from the father's side who have been the keepers of the family traditions. Once the child receives a, so to speak, primary education from their grandparents, they're going to absorb the basic upbringings and teachings from their father, depending on what his father and what their family are doing. On the contrary, in America, we believe that children should always be with their parents, but at the same time, they should perceive their child as an independent person. We tend to give children more freedom. If we compare that to uh, bringing up children in Kazakhstan, I noticed that Children from the provinces, they tend to be shy, especially girls. I think it's, it, but, but it's, it's about the Asian culture. I keep telling my students that, you know what, um, if you want to be successful in this world, you've got to be self-confident and you've got to have self-esteem, which is very, very uh, lacking in many, many cultures. I want to say that, uh, Values like self-esteem or self-confidence, they are very important in everybody's life. Generally, the main task of an American parent is to provide comfort and a wholesome environment for their children. Despite the obvious differences between our cultures, I still want to instill a respect for the customs that have developed here for centuries and to develop some kind of behavior in my children. Today, Timor and I will go to Bulbul Apa, who has kindly agreed to help me understand the intricacies of traditional Kazakh upbringing. Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Everything is fine, thanks. We have several questions for you. That's why we came. Oh, I'm glad. Come in. Thank you very much. What a beautiful house you have. On 
Undoubtedly, the centuries-old folk wisdom of the Kazakh people has transformed into traditions and customs, which were strictly observed and passed down from generation to generation. As a result, a huge layer of culture was formed. And even in our modern times, with our advanced technologies that are moving at crazy speeds, Bulbul Apa continues to store these sacred traditions and knowledge in order to pass it on to future generations. Although young people, of course, like they do all over the world, prefer to live in a new way, this doesn't change the love of traditions and the craving for the roots and knowledge of older customs. Woven from the strong threads of centuries-old wisdom, traditions and rituals have so strongly entered daily life of Kazakh people that they couldn't be influenced by any external forces. The great thing about Kazakh culture is the, the family institute. So they value family a lot here. And sometimes it may even seem too much to, to my Australian eyes, to be honest, when the brothers and sisters are always helping out each other, which doesn't really happen in Australia, because Australia is more of an individualistic society, you know, the Anglo-Saxon, so everyone by himself. I noticed, um, you know, here they celebrate, when they got diplomas, they celebrate all together. They make a party and it's very solemnal, it's very important for families. In terms of education, there is a difference between France and Kazakhstan. Bulbulapa, thank you so much for inviting us to this beautiful yurt. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about my son. As he was just born, I want to know the traditions, how I should raise him according to just the Kazakh traditions. Could you tell me a little bit about what I can do to help him to also follow these traditions of Kazakhstan? My American friend recently became a father for the second time, and he wants to know all about our traditions concerning the child. Can you tell him about our traditions and customs? Kazakhs have a lot of traditions related to when a baby is born. As it turned out, Kazakh families have special rituals for a newly born baby, and they are carried out during the first 40 days of life. The first such holiday is called Shilde Khana, which is held mainly in honor of the birth of a child and a young mother. It was held mainly on an odd date of the month. On this day, they always invited guests, made a generous feast, and sometimes organized contests of strongmen and horse races. But what are these rituals related to, and why do they have to perform them before the child turns 40 days old? Why 40 days? Well, Kazakhs have a lot of superstitions related to newborns. From the birth of a child to their adulthood, Kazakhs traditionally say that 40 days, the child and the mother are still between a stage of life and death. It is believed that the child has not fully settled in this world. On the other hand, a woman is given 40 days to recover from childbirth. Basically, I think these cultures are more or less the same in every country, only that there is a slight difference. We, when a baby is born, um, no one is allowed to visit for the first uh, seven days. Well, we have a similar thing here, only that it's 40 days. And I, I try to analyze that, and I try to actually ask people why 40 days, and they say that because this is cold country and uh, for child not to be infected. I, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. Now, in a tropical country, it's hot and uh, you, know, you can't possibly, so the baby begins to see the light, I mean, to walk around with the, the mother after a few days. We wait for 100 days. Why? Because 230 or maybe 300 years ago, we had nothing to eat. It was very difficult to survive. And unfortunately, many children died because of the climate or other reasons. If after 100 days the child was still alive and healthy, you could live on. Therefore, we count up to 100 days. Kazakhs have many rituals. We have an interesting tradition. When a baby is born prematurely, it is called a shalabai. They put him on a taimak, as if he was lying in a womb. What do they do next? Premature babies were then kept in this headdress for 40 days. The mother would only feed the baby. Then the wool and the leather were put inside of this hat and hung like a cradle for 40 days on the kirigya of a yurt. Why did we do like that? Because the baby laid for 40 days just like that, as if in the womb. 
and he or she would grow up to be a full-fledged child. In the womb, they would also lay in the fetal position. This is how he would lay in the taimak. The baby is laid for 40 days, isn't he? Yes, the child would lay for 40 days. But actually, it is considered how many days early he was born. If 15 or 17 days earlier, for example, he would lay in the taimak for that exact amount of days. As soon as the baby got stronger, his cradle was removed from the kirigye. Tell us what other traditions were there. There were some other traditions. When a young woman would find out that she was pregnant, she'd visit her parents' home. And when she arrived, the wives of her brothers, her sisters-in-law, would throw special silverware, such as a ladle, at her feet. If the ladle would fall upside down, then a boy would be born. If it was on the other side, then a girl would be born. That's how they would find out the sex of a child. And it was always correct. When the child was already born, the Kazakhs would bring a kalja, especially for their mother. A kalja was given to the young mother so that she would recover faster. After the relief from the burden, the kalja was prepared for her. Even before the celebration in her honor, Meat broth was prepared for the recovery of the woman who gave birth. Now I want to show you the neck of a lamb. I brought it here on purpose. This dish was eaten only by a woman. And it's for the spine, yeah? For a spine? No, from the neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. From neck. For the neck. Okay, great. Interesting. Kalja toys for the young mother was carried out with a special purpose. The woman had to eat the lamb's neck in order for her child to hold up their head faster. That is, to get stronger physically. This bone was then strung on a rope and stored up for 40 days. Many women kept the kalja for many years. This bone has been preserved since the birth of my granddaughter, and we still keep it. On the third day after birth, they proceed to do the main things, putting a child into a special bed. And remember when we were in the et ethnic village, mm -hmm. there was like some special cradle for the baby. What's it called? It's Bisik. Bisik. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me about Bisik? During Shil de Toy, the rite called the Bisike Salu takes place, and the Tishtuma is also performed. Relatives from the mother's side of the child would not bring the cradle. The Kazakhs would never bring the cradle from the mother's relatives. The child is considered to be the heir of the family by the child's father. Therefore, the grandmothers and sisters-in-laws would prepare and perform this ritual. They would put the baby into a bisik, or a cradle. It was mostly the grandmothers who would lay the child in the cradle. They would then perform this tushtuma ritual. Sweets and candies and kort were placed through the holes at the bottom of the cradle. After that, all the guests were handed out sarkut, which is a treat for children. During the Shidulchana or Bisike Salu, a ritual called Esim Koyu or At Koyu was performed, which means the naming ceremony. That is, they would give the child a name. This ritual was also usually entrusted to the oldest of the family. So, well, we have a similar thing, and after seven days, we give the naming ceremony. A baby doesn't have a name until he or she turns seven days. On that day, the family members gather together. There could be different things on the table, like honey, like sugar, salt, and, you know, different, different things, and we give the name to the child. So, according to the culture or the religion of the family, put money on the table and uh, they just pray that uh, we hope all these things come your way and all those things. 
In the Bisik, everything is very thoroughly arranged for a child. First, we can see the tubik. It is made of felt, and they put ashes in it. Why? Because it would keep you warm. And secondly, ash would also absorb moisture, and the baby would stay dry. And when choosing a bisik, you need to pay attention to a couple of things. When the mother would sit and hold the bisik on her lap, it should be comfortable for her to swing it. In this way, the bisik must be chosen carefully. When a mother breastfeeds her baby, she should also be comfortable. This is called a kolbao. It's for bandaging the hands of the child. This is the kolbao and this is the ayakbao for the legs. Here are two laces. Why are they so flat? Well, because when the child would lie down, they should not chafe the child's arms. Such flat ropes do not cause discomfort to the baby. And they are tied like this, from above. The child is very comfortable and feels good at the same time. And this is the ayakbao. It is tied to the newborn's legs. This is to keep them straight and healthy. The besik is the unwritten philosophy of Kazakhs how we raise and bring up our children using the besik. And after the besik ke salu, we also had the shil de hanatoi. The besik is very good because it's very convenient for the mother while she's recovering her back after childbirth. And the baby is always clean. In addition, such a cradle has a beneficial effect on the health of the child. His body develops properly. I can tell you who was in a besik and who wasn't. <laughs> Yes, I did. If we talk about this headdress, it's called a Taj, the headdress of the Khans. Men wore it under a beaver hat, a Borik. There has always been a beaver Borik under the Taj. That's how they dressed. You can see it in archive photos. And this is the main feature of wearing hats among the Kazakhs. And this is the morak. It can be sewn in different ways. Was it worn only by the descendants of the Hans and Sultans? The bees, rich people, the heads of provinces would wear it. For a little boy, for a little baby. Not for a little baby. Oh, for the Hans, okay. This is not, for, this is not a baby's hat. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Two hats. Wow. 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 The common people wouldn't wear such a headdress because it was a symbol of status. It's feature. Yeah, wow. How do I wear it? Like this way. Like, yeah, this way. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, no, other way. Like this. Uh -huh. To help me. Like that, yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Good, yeah, it's nice. You like it? Yeah. You want to take my picture? Of course. Take my picture. <laughs> yes. Yay. Just take a picture. Oh, That's what we do from it's the okay. first. Uh, yeah. Good, good, good. Oui. It's okay. Great. Super. <laughs> I will show my son when he gets older. Yeah. It's no secret that the ancestors of the Kazakhs used to put faith in spirits. People in the steppe used to believe that there were good and evil spirits. So to get rid of these evil spirits, various amulets were used. They would tie them to the cradle or sew them in the children's clothes or attach them to a headdress. And by the way, this tradition continues to this day. Eight fox legs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. There are 32 fox legs. <laughs> 32 legs. 32 legs. Yeah, or 16. Well. No, 32. Oh, because four. I have four legs. I forgot to spot it. <laughs> wow, very you, nice. You, you have too many foxes. Too many on your foxes. Head. Yeah, 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 yeah. Too many foxes on I'm the like head. A fox. I'm like a fox. Oh, wow, that's good. Bulbula Pa, my friend noticed these hats. Can you tell us a little bit more about these hats specifically? Our girls would wear these hats from an early age and were decorated with so-called uki, the tip of the cap, which is decorated with owl feathers. And this headdress was called the kepesh. The kepesh was worn only by girls when the boys would wear a takia. 
This one also looks like a hat. But the top of the takiya was flat. It was considered a lucky charm for children. Then boys and girls, as they would grow up a little, would wear a burik. Here are the buriks. The beaver burik and the marten hat. It's made from marten. And this is a beaver burik. Is this a hat for a young girl? Yes, it's a girl's headdress. And this headdress is for men. They are both made from beaver. Kazakhs paid great attention to this material, from which they made clothes and hats. As they say, the material shines like silk. Masati is the Kazakh word for silk. These are the materials, velvet and jacquard silk. This is silk. Here's a silk hat for men. This torgi is one of the types of hats. And this is fox fur. These are decorative clothes of sal and serich. This is what they call fur tumak. In the cradle, they would hang this uki, which is the feathers of an owl. But this is not a real uki. It was considered a talisman for a child, so that he or she wouldn't be jinxed. The idea was that it would be better for someone with an evil eye to look at the uki and not at the baby. The uki was worn by both kelens and batirs. And the uki was also sewn into the woman's clothing, called karkara, and for women's hats too. All of this was considered a strong talisman to protect against various troubles and misfortunes. This is our tradition. And how long do they stay in this basic for how many, how many months? Up to 40 days. Only after that would the 40 days feast begin, called the shildetoy. On the 40th day after the baby is born, a special rite called the Kurkanan Shagaru was performed. It was believed that the child was strong enough to be shown to the relatives. The newborn's hair and nails were then cut off. The hair was then wrapped in a cloth and kept as a talisman, and the nails were buried where people don't walk. The child was then dressed in new clothes, and this ceremony was performed by women only. The husbands wouldn't take part in this rite. But concerning traditions and cultures, I notice in Kazakhstan, they have a culture like uh, cutting, it's cutting the rope when a baby is just toddling, so we cut the way so that's uh, the way. Now, we don't have this. Later, after the ceremony of 40 days from birth, when the child is already seven or eight months, they would learn to crawl. Another ceremony is performed. When the baby crawls, a dish with national sweets would be carried under his little body. This ceremony symbolizes that the baby has grown stronger and has become almost independent. And then all the guests would eat sweets from this dish. It's a joy. Yes, and it's a joy for the parents as well. When the child is almost one year old, the child is already beginning to take their first steps. In order for the child to quickly gain strength and begin to walk confidently, another rite called Tusao Kesir was carried out. Here the first birthday is considered to be a big holiday. We celebrate it for 100 days. It's a very important date for children. We congratulate all the guests and we invite family friends and congratulate them on the 100 day holiday. Then we celebrate the first year. Tusao Kesir literally means cutting of the fetters. This ceremony is performed as soon as the baby has taken their first steps. The godmother wraps the baby's legs with special threads. I do know there is a tradition of letting a child into a life where they, they put a piece of string um, on his legs and they, they, they cut the strings later on. Uh, so I was actually part of that tradition once. I'm making this thread for the Tusao Kesir. For this, parents prepare three different threads. One of them is made from green grass, because each person has his own destiny. For some, unfortunately, the seed is few in number. The green grass threads for the Tusao Kesir symbolizes a rich and numerous offspring. Second, so that the child will always be full and that everyone would live in abundance, the fetters used to be cut with sheep's intestines. Now many people use it as motley thread for the Tusao Kesir. In the lifetime of a person, different things may happen, both good and bad, joys and sadnesses. And so that this child is ready for life and would not see misfortunes, so that his life would be full of only sunny days and that rainy days would be absent. But if there will be such, that he does not lose heart. A motley thread for the Tusao Kesir is for the baby to live in harmony and maintain balance in any situation. 
барлыгы өмірдин бар кезиндери сөйлөлүп басып кетпесин, өмірдин кезиндери көлөнкөлү болуп, мүжүлүп калмасын, ошо кезде кең устап жүрсүн деген өмірдин тепе теңдигин сакта болсун мына алашып кен кылат. And who cuts the feathers? Nimble housewives would cut the child's way. So women and now even men can cut, right? Well, it's like that now. Nowadays, the rituals are being renewed. Mostly, the fetters are cut by women. But this role isn't for anyone. Only active women who keep their houses in order and who are respected among relatives are presented with opportunities to cut the bonds. After cutting the fetters, village children would have a contest. And this was a kind of example for the baby from older children. After that, the children were given gifts. And during the ceremony, a knuckle bone, a book, and a whip were given to the child to use. Useful things for a child, which suggested that he or she would grow up to be a hardworking, intelligent, and strong person. But now, money is being put in. This has already been invented by modern society. Cutting the fetters is done for both boys and girls. What is, what is it written? It's like a Chinese, yeah, in writing. Chinese? <laughs> so, wow, Kosigia, what is that? Traditionally, the people paid special attention to the upbringing of girls. The people say that a girl is a guest. Therefore, the girl in Kazakh society was treated like gold. She is a symbol of beauty, restraint, grace, and good manners. This is due to the fact that the girl personifies the beginning of life, since she is assigned the special role in the future to become a mother and a wife. When a girl would turn 12, another ancient ceremony would take place. On the right side of the house, a special place is fenced off which is called the Kosigye. Inside the Kosigye, there is a beautiful bed where the girl is seated, demonstrating that a bride is growing in the house. The Kazakhs still have such tradition. Many say sit on the right side to the unmarried girl. This is the Kosigye. These are the rituals that Kazakhs also have. Thus, the girl's parents demonstrate to the relatives that their daughter is growing up and that they are preparing her for marriage, for family life. Since she'll have to live away from her relatives and parents, she's prepared for this in advance. Therefore, in this kosigye, they put separate dishes, and there's a sleeping place as well. This is a symbol of the fact that the girl must now be able to keep the household on her own, to do the dishes, cook food, and take care of her relatives. From birth to the end of their lives, Kazakh women traditionally wore a lot of jewelry that could tell almost everything about its owner. Whether she is married or not, what is her age, where she is from, whether her family is rich. The first jewelry, in the form of various amulets, was put on a girl in infancy. The various amulets and charms were then tied to the children's legs or arms, sewn onto a hat called a takia, or hung over the headboard. Growing up, girls put on massive and complex jewelry. Its number also increased. The most luxurious and richest were the silver jewelry sets. They were worn not only on the neck, wrists, and fingers, but also on the forehead, woven into braids, inlaid with belts and hats. Many of these decorations rang when walking. And according to legend, they would drive away evil spirits with their sounds. Silver jewelry was very popular and widespread among the people of the East. Some girls had their ears pierced since the age of four. This custom came down to us from ancient times. Piercing the, the ear, I think some family, they do this very, very early. My daughter, for, for instance, didn't have an ear pierced until she, she was about 20, 26, because I said to her, you do it whenever you want. I'm not gonna do it for you. And so she did it when she felt that, okay, I, I needed I, I, uh, some earrings. When a Kazakh girl would get married, after a while, her sisters would come to her. And if she gave them a ring or some other valuable thing, then it was a kind of secret sign that the new family was treating her well. The sisters would pass on the rings to their mother, and she gathered guests and showed them the ring. And everyone understood that the girl was doing well in her new family. 
By the time the girl was married, she was almost completely covered in silver. And this is uh, very interesting. I wanted to ask also, you know, this is very funny about, the, they say that in Kazakhstan, that the boy learns how to ride a horse yeah. before he can walk. When should the boy learn to ride a horse? Ride a horse. So when do we put boys on a horseback? This event is for the boys. To make him a real horseman, they would put him on a horse. A shamai is like a saddle. On both sides, there are special pockets so that the child doesn't fall. At the same time, the boy is comfortable and they put him on the horse. Who teaches them to ride the horse? Is it the father should teach father. them? Father should teach them. Father should teach them. Yeah. Wow, yeah. You should teach them. I should teach them. <laughs> yeah. I should teach them to ride a you horse. Teach. Okay. <laughs> okay. Together, yeah? Together. Yeah, together. together. <laughs> it's very good. Okay, I'll try. Mm. Now I already learned. You were a cowboy. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a cowboy. Yeah. yeah. According to national customs, every boy, regardless of who his father was, was trained in horse riding, archery, and weaponry. The formation of the horsemen stretches over several years. Each stage was recorded by a rite. The rite of the Atka Mingizu symbolizes the new stage of a boy's life, when he becomes a horseman. Having saddled a horse for the first time, it was preceded by a solemn ritual of donating a horse called a baisiri. By tradition, the horse was given, and then the child was seated by the child's relatives from the mother's side. Nowadays, few people conduct such rituals, but in early ages, this event was very important for the boy's parents. For the first time, in the presence of all of his relatives, they would put him on a horse presented specially for him. From that time on, the boy joined the community of adults, received the first instructions and wishes of his elders to become a horseman. After the boy learned to steer the horse and sit tight in the saddle, he, among his elders, was going on his first long horse trip. This event was marked by the Tokum Kagar. The becoming of the horseman is a long and thorny path of the ascent of the warrior and the hero. The child was put on the horse from three or four years old. I think uh, horses have been part of Kazakh culture for the past 6,000 years. It is no surprise that uh, Kazakh people have a lot of uh, ceremonies, a lot of sports activities related to horses. Um, I know about uh, such sports activity like Kokpa and all these things. So I think these are very interesting things. There is an interesting tradition I have observed where a guy jumps on a horse and goes after a girl, and if he kisses the girl, well, that's, that's great. Uh, you know, the kind of the girl. There are a lot of horses that, that are part of, of all these traditions because horse, is a, kind of like a central animal uh, within Kazakh culture. It's In medieval times, according to reliable sources, not only men, but also women, equally brilliantly mastered the skill of riding a horse and were known as excellent riders. If girls were taught to ride a horse, then the boy and then the younger man had to learn how to control the horse. He had to master the moral and ethical code of the horseman. That is, to become one with his horse, to learn to take care of it. Equestrian games for the steppe people were the education of courage, valor, patience, and love for their people, nature, and homeland. It'll be a real Kazakh Zhigit yeah. on the horse. Yeah. Kazakh Zhigit. And I think this is very good also for, for the boy. He'll feel like very, very strong yeah. on the horse. It's, it's very good. We'll teach him to saddle up. Mm, saddle, saddle up. Saddle up. Yeah. <laughs> saddle up. <laughs> This has been such an amazing day. I've learned so many things. I'm very grateful for the lessons that Bulbul Apa taught me. I never cease to be amazed at the wisdom of the Kazakhs. Of course, I will take these tips into account in the raising of my own children. Generally, the main value of our people is raising our future generations. Why were we born? Kazakhs have an expression, let my generation live up to a thousand years. This doesn't mean that only one generation lived for a thousand years, but that generation after generation would grow up and would live for a millennia. Surely I will take all of this advice into account when raising my children. After learning all of these traditions, I can say that the basis of raising children in Kazakh families is the folk customs and traditions. Kazakhs didn't bother to write down many of these norms and recommendations for raising children as they drew these conclusions from life itself and instilled the best of them. 
humanity, hospitality, respect for elders, generosity of the soul and dexterity of the body, these qualities come down from antiquity and are alive among the Kazakh people to this day. And I can only add that this experience must be used in our life in order to raise our children as trustworthy people.